Welcome to Case in Point, produced by the University of Pennsylvania Law School. I'm your host, Steve Barnes. In this episode, we'll examine the recent landmark United States Supreme Court decision, Comptroller v. Wynn, and what it means for taxpayers who reside in states that do not provide a tax credit for income tax paid outside their home state. To help us look at this somewhat complicated issue, we'll be joined by Michael Knoll, the Theodore K. Warner Professor of Law and Professor of Real Estate here at the University of Pennsylvania. Michael is also the co-director of Penn Law's Center for Tax Law and Policy. Michael, with Ruth Mason from the University of Virginia, wrote an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief, that was cited in the Supreme Court majority's decision in the case. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. So if you could please, could you walk us through the basic facts of the case and what the ruling means? Uh, the case is Comptroller of the Treasury of Maryland versus Wynn. The case comes out of Maryland. It involves state taxes within Maryland. Maryland, like most states in the United States, taxes its residents on their domestic income as well as their out-of-state income. Maryland also taxes non-residents on the income they earn within the state. However, unlike most states, Maryland does not offer a full credit for taxes paid to foreign states and municipalities against its state taxes. It only offers a partial credit. What that means is if you earn income outside of Maryland, you're going to have to pay some Maryland tax, even if you pay more in taxes to the source state than you pay than your tax rate in Maryland would have you pay. Those are the facts of the basic tax system involved in Wynn. The facts are that a married couple, Brian and Karen Wynn, who are shareholders in a healthcare services company, Maxim, that is based in Maryland and has operations in most states of the union, and indeed they file tax returns in returns in 39 states in 2006, found themselves paying taxes both in the states where they earned income and, in addition, having to pay tax on that out-of-state income in Maryland. So they brought suit alleging that the Maryland tax system violated the Constitution of the United States. And the Supreme Court found that? Well, and ultimately, after a long process of working their way through the state courts, and then the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court by a five to four majority, agreed with the Wins and with the Maryland High Court that in fact the Maryland tax system is discriminatory in violation of the Constitution. Right, so it brings up the issue of double taxation. Could you just uh, briefly describe why it's unconstitutional in the majority's uh, opinion? Well, I guess the place to start probably is with the Commerce Clause. Sure, the Commerce Clause of the Constitution provides Congress with the power to regulate commerce among the states. And as the majority traces it back to an opinion by Justice Marshall in the 1820s, there has long been contained within the Commerce Clause the idea of something called a dormant or negative Commerce Clause a restriction on the ability of states to regulate commerce. That dormant commerce clause is interpreted by the courts over the years, provides for essentially a level playing field. The idea that states cannot discriminate against out-of-state residents, they can't engage in protectionist activities, nor can they engage in activities that prevents their residents from engaging in business outside the state. Why? What, why? Well, the logic for that really goes back to the time of the colonies and even before the Constitution, when under the Articles of Confederation, the states would engage in protectionist activity against other states. And so we had a very divided marketplace. And one of the main justifications for getting together here in Philadelphia and having a constitutional convention 
was to eliminate tariffs and other restrictions that in a sense that essentially made not a single market economy, but 13 separate economies for each of the states. So they were trying to enshrine a system where there could be a more open economy. A more open economy. And the idea behind that is the states, to the extent they regulate and tax and otherwise engage in various kinds of activity, are supposed to keep a level playing field right. between residents and non-residents. So perhaps this is a bit of nuance, but you've written or co-written that this is not exactly about double taxation. What do you mean? OK. Um, the argument is framed by the taxpayers. I think pretty much from the beginning was is double tax. The winds challenged Maryland's tax system as a form of unconstitutional double taxation. Their complaint was that Maryland taxed their income earned out of state after other states had already taxed that income. However, as Maryland argued, problem with that argument is that Maryland was legitimately exercising its authority to tax and on a residence basis, and other states were legitimately exercising their authority to tax on a source base. Those two taxes conflicted, and if the problem is double taxation, one of them has to give way. And Maryland asked the question, which state has to give way, source or residence? And what's the constitutional basis for requiring either the source or resident state to give way? Well, the real problem with Maryland's tax, in our view, and as we wrote, is not a question of double tax. It's a matter of tax discrimination. That the Maryland tax, even standing on its own, discourages cross-border commerce and should be struck down. The court, fortunately, largely bought that argument. And that's the argument that we made. That's the argument that Alan Viard and the tax economists made. That, I think, is what references in the opinion sometimes to the economics of the situation and the arguments by the economists are, are about. If you could explain uh, for us, please, what do you mean? How do you define tax discrimination? OK. Um, yeah, tax discrimination is um, a, a term that's used very much in the tax literature, both in the United States and, and, and elsewhere. And the idea is a tax system discriminates when it discriminates against cross-border commerce in favor of in-state commerce. And that has two elements, generally. One element is pure protectionist element. The tax system makes it more difficult for out-of-state residents to compete in-state. Second element is that the tax system makes it difficult for residents to go abroad and apply their trade abroad, and instead encourages them to stay at, at home. And the term tax discrimination has, has been the term that sort of cropped up to capture those ideas, because it's very similar to what we think of as more broadly in the law as discrimination, right? treating different people, treating people differently on an illegitimate basis. Here tends to be residents or, the, or where you're applying your economic trade. Uh, it's more of an economic idea and less uh, of a social I idea, but it is uh, very much um, question of discrimination in the traditional way. Tax discrimination sort of gets the most attention in the European Union. These issues have a real parallel with the European Union. Uh, the European Union obviously is much more recent than the United States. Uh, it's about roughly the same size as the United States. And it also is a single market economy created out of independent states. And to many in the European Union, the model was the United States. Because it was much later, their constitution, their constitution in effect, their treaties, which operate as a constitutional restraint, are much newer and are still being amended. The European Union has something called free movement rights or the fundamental freedoms. Residents of, or citizens of any member state uh, have free movement rights. They can 
trade goods. They can move. They can uh, establish businesses in other states within the European Union. And if the laws discourage that, they have the ability to go to court in Europe, in, in local state court in Europe, challenge the law. And if it raises a question of European Union law, it's supposed to then be sent to the Court of Justice of the European Union to answer that question. Unlike the United States Supreme Court, which takes cases on cert, CJ, the CJEU takes whatever cases are sent to it. And they've received a lot of tax discrimination cases. Indeed, over the last 20 years or so, about 200 cases. So they're dealing with these issues all the time. Interestingly, in Europe, these cases have dramatically changed the way the European community operates. That is, states have had to change how they provide through their tax code services to individuals, essentially welfare benefits. Um, and the states have also changed how they tax corporations in response to these rules. So they're very similar between the US and the, and the European Union, this basic principle of a level playing field. The US law is much older. But the law in Europe is generally more developed because they've got many more cases. <coughs> and they don't have an overarching federal tax system like we do. So all of their taxes, basically, are state taxes. And so when these issues show up, it's not a Maryland state tax of 5%, 5 a county tax of 3%. right? It's tax at the state level, 20 30%, potentially. Great. So we'll get to the um, interesting nature of the 5 to 4 opinion from the Supreme Court in a moment, from the justices there. But I wanted to ask you, you wrote an amicus brief, what's uh, known as a friend of the court brief, um, that was cited by the majority of the justices in their decision. Um, could you explain that a little bit, please? Sh sure. Uh, I wrote with a colleague, uh, Ruth Mason of UVA, uh, a friend of the court brief. And there was another brief written, a uh, principal writer was Alan Viard of the AEI. And he was joined by a number of tax economists and even a couple of tax uh, law professors as well. And we really tried to flush out the economics behind these issues. So the question is, what does, in essence, a level playing field mean? What does it imply? How would you uh, test it? And the court has long used something called an internal consistency test, which the way it operates is it says, take a state, Maryland, assume every other state adopts the Maryland tax system, and then ask yourself, is cross-border activity taxed at a higher rate than purely domestic activity? The Maryland uh, tax failed that. That was the justification for the High Court of Maryland striking it down. That was the justification that was picked up by the Supreme Court. And what's interesting there is though the test is about 40, 45 years old, over the last 30 years, no case has been struck down by the Supreme Court on that basis. Other courts have continued to use it, but the Supreme Court has not. And our brief, and that of the tax economists as well, argued rather than continuing to cut back on this test, we thought that the court should embrace it and use it, even though it's not perfect. It doesn't match up exactly with all of the economics that we and the tax economists said it is the right way or the best way to analyze this. It does a very good job, and we were hoping that they would re-embrace it and reinvigorate it. And in fact, that's what they did in the opinion. Great. So with that, in a recent paper you wrote that the court's decision, and I quote more or less, <laughs> I paraphrase, <laughs> that the decision, the court's decision could reshape the constitutional balance between the state's sovereign interest in collecting taxes and the national interest in maintaining an open economy. I'm curious, what are your thoughts on what the stakes were, depending on the outcome of the case at the Supreme Court? Yeah, I thought that the national economy, was, or, or there was a real possibility of, depending upon how the decision went, uh, 
of allowing the states to take actions which would really compromise the nature of a national economy. And had Maryland won, in effect, the court would have been saying, you don't have to grant a full credit for taxes paid to, out of, to other jurisdictions. You can tax in such a way as to create a very unlevel playing field to discourage cross-border commerce. So for example, Maryland, which the tax here, state tax, the county tax, which was the tax at issue, was 3.2%. State tax was about 5%. Call it 8% in total. The 3.2% didn't get a credit. The 4.75% did. The concern is, if Maryland had won the case, Maryland then could have said, all right, let's not grant a credit on the state tax, the state portion either. We really need the revenue. We provide good services. It's tough to get revenue. We need revenue. And we're looking to get revenue from people who earn income out of state and consume services in state. Well, in that case, 8% tax, no tax credit. So they could have just, in essence, expanded the amount of tax, uh, expanded the double taxation in other words. Right. They certainly, well, the risk is then other states would do the same sort of thing. And so if a Maryland resident earns income in New York, which has, I believe, a tax that's higher than 8%, or at least in some parts of New York, then without any credit, there's a danger of paying a total of 16 on cross-border income, only about 8 on domestic income. And if that were, was to start happening around the country, you would have much, it would be much more difficult for any corporation. Think of it as Maxim, if you want. Think of it as Coca-Cola, of operating around the country. Right. And because they would be paying much higher taxes on cross-border income than on in-state income. But that would also impact the individual taxpayer, right? Their personal income tax, is that correct? Well, for example, the wins um, might have looked at, do they want to stay in Baltimore? Or, sorry, do they want to stay in Maryland? Um, how much are we paying in taxes if we move to another state that perhaps didn't have this approach, that didn't tax out of state income without giving a credit? How much would we save? Is it worth moving? Um, my, my guess is at the at just the county level, it wasn't. But if that becomes the norm, if it happens at the state level, and many states do it, there may very well be a strong incentive for lots of taxpayers and businesses, et cetera, to relocate. Um, and even if the case went that way, hopefully the states wouldn't have gone down this road. But I wouldn't have been confident about that. So, so those are the stakes. That's why it's an important case. It was a very important case because it really could have it threatened to disrupt the national economy. So in your view, this was the appropriate decision made by the majority in the case, but this was not the usual five to four decision in terms of what some see occasionally as the, the typical lineup in the majority opinion when there are five to four decisions. No, what I was your take on that? Sorry, absolutely not. I mean, that, that's exactly right. Uh, it was by no means the standard five to four lineup, which one usually sees is four liberal justices, four conservative justices, and the current swing vote, Justice Kennedy going with one side or another, and that determining what the court's decision is. Instead, the majority, uh, the opinion was written by Justice Alito, one of the conservative justices. He was joined by Justice Roberts, who's also considered a member of the conservative wing, and Justice Kennedy, the swing vote. But they were joined by two of the liberal justices, Justices Breyer and Justice Kagan, uh, who all sort of were on that majority opinion. The dissent were two of the liberal justices, the principal dissent written by Justice Ginsburg. She was joined by Sotomayor. She was also joined by Scalia, Justice Scalia, a member, of, conservative member of the court, who also wrote his own opinion. And there was a third dissenting opinion written by Scalia, I'm sorry, written by Justice Thomas, also a member of the conservative wing of the court. So we had two conservatives, two liberals, 
on one side. We had two conservatives, two liberals, and the swing vote on the other side. We had three dissents, which is probably why between the lineup and the number of dissents, it took so long for the opinion to get out, over six months since it was argued. And the dissents arguments very much fell into two groups. The two most conservative members uh, of the dissents, Scalia and Thomas, are quite skeptical of the Dormant Commerce Clause. They read the Commerce Clause as a grant to Congress. And Congress has the power to step in and stop states from taxing in ways that would interfere with interstate commerce. But in their view, there is no negative or self-executing Commerce Clause that restricts the states. The liberal justices took a different view. They, they don't subscribe to the view that the, the Commerce Clause uh, is so tightly limited. They focused a little more, I mean, two arguments. One, they made a consistency argument. It's not consistent with precedent. And the majority said it was. Simple facts here are the precedent is terribly confused. The court has called its own jurisprudence in this area, both a, qu a quagmire. <sighs> And so the cases are all over the place. So it's not surprising that both can find cases they like and cases they don't like. The more policy-oriented argument of the dissent really focused on the need for Maryland to collect taxes. And, it's a, and it needs the ability, in their view, to tax the winds who consume services in Maryland but earn a lot of money outside Maryland, and therefore pay a lot of tax there, and maybe not so much to Maryland, they thought it was important for the state of Maryland to be able to tax the winds, and that Maryland should choose between, in essence, um, allowing a credit or maintaining a level playing field versus their need for revenue. The logic being, if I'm correct in reading this, that the winds and anyone else who works outside, earns outside the state, still use the highway, still have their trash picked up, and- They have five children, they send them to public exactly. school. Exactly, that's very much their logic. And what, what the court, in effect, says, it didn't so much deal directly with that argument, is it says, you've got a lot of flexibility, Maryland, in how you can tax. But there are some limitations. And one of the key limitations is this idea of a level playing field. You can't discriminate against cross-border commerce, even if you need the revenue, and even if people aren't paying enough revenue to Maryland in light of what they are getting in services. Right. So now the majority, it's an interesting group there, not, the, not to my knowledge anyway, the usual uh, five justice majority one sees in a lot of cases. Could you explain um, what the cohering um, logic of their opinion was? Well, I, I like to think that in spite of some of them being conservative and some of them being liberal, they didn't see this as an ideological issue. Uh, it's possible to read some language in the dissents as staking out a conservative and a liberal position, in the sense of the conservative position of known dormant commerce clause, a liberal position about the need to tax. And I think you've got a bunch of conservatives and liberals in the majority striking this down because, one, they believe in, in the commerce clause. They certainly accept it in, in a broad grant in protecting our national uh, economy. And they recognize that Maryland has a great deal of flexibility. They can tax at a high rate. They could tax at a low rate. This doesn't say anything about, in essence, liberal or conservative tax policy. And Maryland has a lot of flexibility in how it chooses to allocate that burden. What they can't do, though, is they can't discriminate against cross-border commerce. They cannot discourage interstate activity. OK, so what's next? And let's start with Maryland. Okay. Well, Maryland first has to decide how it's going to restructure its tax system to comply with the court's requirements. In addition, Maryland is, has already received a number of requests for refunds from taxpayers, and, ta and I would expect Maryland to receive many more. Maryland, as I understand, has a three-year statute of limitations. So taxpayers who 
haven't received a credit and may be eligible for it in light of this decision can go back and amend their returns or file new returns covering the last three years in light of this decision seeking uh, a refund. I understand many Maryland residents have already filed refund requests even for earlier years while this case was going through litigation and it took several years to protect their position. Um, Maryland is potentially facing about $200 million in refunds that it may have to pay. My understanding is the largest amount, $40 million or so, comes from Montgomery County. Uh, and that money will have to be made up, ultimately, as I understand it, by the counties, even though Maryland State will write the check. They're expecting the money to come back from the counties. The counties, obviously, are going to be financially strapped, as most counties are in the US and presumably will need to raise revenue by raising taxes to make up for it. Okay. And in terms of other states, what other states may be impacted by the Supreme Court ruling? Um, well, I think states are starting to look at their tax systems to see who, who is and uh, who, who is not. I suspect, or my understanding is that when the issue shows up, it's most likely to be in terms of county taxes as opposed to state taxes. And those are not studied as closely. There are not as many people knowledgeable about them. I think it's going to take some real digging and looking around, uh, as well as at the state level, you know, just checking to see wh where credits are and aren't granted, and what kinds of tax systems, because there are a lot of different kinds of tax systems. Uh, there can be gross receipts taxes. There can be complicated versions of sales taxes, uh, commuter taxes, just to sort of look at, see what taxes are on the book and how the system as a whole is really dealing with um, the different treatment of residents and non-residents and domestic and out-of-state income. So whether you're a taxpayer, whether you're a state tax official, mm -hmm. uh, what are the mechanics of that? How will this play out? Will it play out just by an individual taxpayer or business requesting refunds? Will it lead to litigation? What do you foresee in that regard? What I think is going to happen is that state and municipal governments are going to have to look closely at their taxes systems, see if they're consistent with the Supreme Court's decision. If they are, fine. If they're not, they're going to need to rejigger those systems to be consistent with constitutional requirements. That's going to mean changing the tax burdens in some ways. Some taxes will be immediately reduced because they're, they're inconsistent. I doubt state municipal governments are going to be anxious to give up those revenues. I think it's hard for them to raise tax revenue, but it's also very hard for them to give up revenue because of demands for services. And so taxes are going to have to go up somewhere on some people if they're going to go down for some people because of the court's decision here. Yeah, particularly at the county and municipal level? Probably, especially at the county and municipal level, because that seems to be, from the briefs that were filed, where it's most likely that the tax systems are not going to be consistent with what the Supreme Court is requiring. Right. So as a final question, do you think overall that the Supreme Court, with their majority decision, made a decision that will overall benefit the economy in interstate commerce? Oh, oh for sure. I mean, I certainly am quite sympathetic to the revenue needs of states and municipalities and the confusion that uh, th this opinion will, will, will gen or not confusion, at least the difficulties it will generate for them in needing to rejigger their tax systems and do so in a politically palatable way. On the other hand, I think if the opinion had gone the other way, it would have at best muddied the water and confused things. And at worst, had it sort of gone clearly in the direction of okaying the tax system that Maryland has, it really had the risk of opening the floodgates, whereby states would be able to start to really segregate their market from other markets and take our national economy and start to divvy it up into a state by state or municipal, uh, municipality by municipality economy. And that's something that we've avoided for a long time. That's long been um, 
something admired worldwide and has been very important for our success and it's going to be important for the continued success of the American economy. So I have no doubt they made the right decision. Great. Well, Michael Knoll, thank you so much for joining right. us. This has been a great discussion. I certainly learned a lot. Uh, thank you for joining us and thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time here at Case in Point. Thank you.